Hello everybody, my name is Viktor Sovetov. I'm co-founder and CEO of Cloudozer, the company behind Derek and Zen project. Today we're going to discuss some thoughts which we had developed during our work on uh, Aaron Kanzen project. We have formulated them in a well form of commandments for the next generation of cloud software. Also, we would like to share a couple of ideas which could be useful to solve real-world problems. Before we start with our commandments, uh, I will have to describe our main project very briefly. Basically, Erwin Kanzen is a new built-from-scratch virtual machine that is able to execute our own code without having an operating system underneath. Development was started in 2009, but the most active development phase began only a year ago. Uh, this VM doesn't share a single line of code with Ericsson's VM, so it's a completely new thing, built to run on Zen virtualized domains. This RVM is optimized for extremely low startup latency. Currently, we start to execute Aaron code in just 4-5 milliseconds after the launch. Also, we are able to spawn new VMs quite fast, at least 10 new VMs per second on single physical node. It's a very important feature of the VM and it's why we had to rebuild Aaron current time from the scratch. We consider the importance of startup latency a bit later. Being just uh, in another runtime, Erwin Kanzen is highly compatible with standard uh, Erwin OTP. We can run the vast majority of Erwin code without any modifications. Though because of having no operating system underneath, Erwin Kanzen is incompatible with some parts of standard library which need to be properly ported to our architecture. Uh, the code of our runtime uh, wasn't released at open source yet, uh, though our build service is available for free and instances built with that service can be used for any purposes uh, without any limitations, so everybody's welcome to come and try it. Right now, this VM is fully functional. The project site and all our demos have been generated by our public build service and are self-hosted now. Recently we have started to build commercial applications with using our technology as a cornerstone and our experience forced us to define seven architectural principles which we would like to share with you now. Well, Cloudozer is a typical IT company started in a shed. It happens that one wall of our shed was clean, so we played a row of pigs in Orwell's animal farm and used this wall to write down our own commandments, which you can see on this slide. Let's discuss them one by one now. Do not assume the presence of operating system underneath. Well, we probably have to confess to ourselves uh, that we have to review the operating system in VMs which are run in clouds. Having an operating system in every instance was important while physical infrastructure have been migrating into clouds and was an organic part of the process. But do we really need the operating system in every instance now or we have to treat it as a limitation? If we look on Linux or Windows, we can see that they were built to manage physical service hardware and share its resources properly between applications run on this single physical host. We believe this model doesn't work anymore, at least for cloud computing. Now, uh, we rather have to use many VMs for a single cloud application and requires completely different resource management, which we have uh, trying to build uh, our functionality of all the operating systems. Working on Erwin can then force us to understand uh, that the real server for our applications is a cloud, and cloud stack is our operating system. 
It isn't a new idea. There were a lot of efforts to simplify OS layer, including the projects presented on this summit. I mean Brilliant Open Mirage project. We also follow this way only in slightly different manner. We interpret the runtime of high-level programming language as operating system. It's only nature of this error, since the language itself gives us proper preemptive multitasking, memory management, etc. So we can simply forget uh, that we need an operating system to run our cloud instance with Erlang inside. Software must be oblivious to boundaries of physical nodes. So, uh, if we treat cloud as our computer, we have to enjoy the elasticity of resources which cloud can provide. If everything is virtual, there is no reason to keep physical nodes in mind and uh, there is no reason to limit ourselves in scalability. It's a real paradigm shift if we rely on elasticity because it can change our vision on how we have to engineer distributed applications and how we have to provision our services. Now we really can scale our applications up and down automatically, even with using current cloud stacks. That paves the road to real horizontal scalability. We only need to stop thinking that parts of our applications should be executed on physical servers, which cannot scale in runtime by their nature. We even can introduce ephemeral services, which do not exist and uh, do not consume any resources while they do not have a workload to execute. Unfortunately, current cloud stacks aren't ready to provide such functionality out of the box, but they've got a good potential for that. The only thing that really has to be changed is uh, the API that cloud stacks is posed to applications. To be really elastic, apps should be able to run and stop nodes from within. And uh, it brings us to the next commandment. All services must share the same auto-scalable fabric. For Everybody's sake, we have to unify management and users' tasks, even if it sounds a bit socialistic. There is a chance to simplify cloud management with using this approach and potential advantages can be countless. At least we will be able to provide autonomous cloud-like ecosystem for applications, almost isolated from external cloud stack. Such approach potentially can significantly reduce deployment and maintenance costs and improve resource scheduling as well. And uh, here I have to remind you importance of startup latency and the idea of ephemeral services. I have mentioned a minute before, uh, now we have uh, an opportunity to use much less pre-started services than we must have now. We can look at an example. Basically, uh, ephemeral service is a service that doesn't exist when it has neither visitors or any other busy work to be done. Uh, this demo shown on this slide runs brand new Zen VM for every incoming HTTP request. Uh, well, there is no practical reasons to do so in the real world, of course. It's uh, just to show that service provisioning can be so fast that user had hardly would notice that. Such fast provisioning enables us to have no pre-started services at all, without sacrificing usability of the services. And uh, it means that we can utilize our hardware much better indeed. So, you can come to uh, this URL and try. It's always run on our side. Next commandment. Run up computations near data they process. Uh, we have considered uh, true elasticity and fast provisioning so far 
And now we have to add the proper isolation of instances, which then gives us for free. With having proper isolation, the big reform of input-output can be discussed. Input-output is quite a problem in data centers nowadays. It generates a lot of network traffic and switching to diskless nodes in data centers will only make situation worse. With uh, using our architecture, uh, we can propose a solution, I think. The idea is simple. We could treat uh, cloud storage as a part of computing cloud and run our lightweight instances as close to physical disks as we can and use them to execute those parts of queries which could benefit affinity to physical disk and uh, reduce network upstream. In other words, uh, if we're going to be elastic, we have to be elastic everywhere, even in I.O. Well, next commandment, child nodes get configuration from the parent only. Uh, another painful problem for nowadays cloud software is configuration management. Many of us even call it chef and puppet hell, uh, since management of big applications can be very difficult even with using sophisticated tools. Surprisingly, Erwan can show a solution in this case. Standard Erwan's library introduces a separation of processes on supervisors and workers. You easily can find details on any Erwan resource. Speaking simply, Erwan introduces a hierarchy of managers. It allows Erwan programmers to manage millions of concurrent processes in distributed environment without making any significant efforts. We believe uh, that expanding that, uh, this approach into virtual machines will help us to distribute per node configurations in large distributed applications at least semi-automatically. And we already started to think of fully automatic provisioning of the configuration data. Avoid administration at all costs. Well, if we can distribute configurations between nodes without having a need in a human administrator, we can organically consider running other administrative tasks automatically. There are a lot of disadvantages of engagement of human beings as administrators, even if not mentioned drinking a beer. Uh, humans are not fast enough. Uh, expanding the team of administrators can be quite complicated because of human factors existence. And we believe that with the proper health of cloud stack, uh, many of administrative tasks can be automated and executed inside an application. I mentioned that uh, we could have supervisor nodes, uh, uh, virtual machines fully dedicated to perform management and configuration tasks. So uh, they are the right places to execute administrative logic, just a natural places. Well, the last and the probably most arguable commandment is uh, SMP is abomination of cloud computing. Uh, that's arguable commandment in uh, a real world which is trying to be so many core as it can right now. But considering new software, we are trying to be abstract from physical nature of our hardware and make services as granular as it possible. Uh, the reason to do so is not to waste resources, but to protect investments by making software ignorant, completely ignorant to hardware specific. In this case, Erwang also can teach us a lot. Using Erwang software in real world has proven that message passing approach to concurrency can work even better than SMP. Also, 
we found numerous advantages of uh, breaking an application into a set of single CPU VMs. Such VMs are much easier and faster to migrate because of their size and requirements. I presume it's, it's quite difficult to uh, well, find a place for VM configured to use, uh, let's say, 16 cores uh, to be instantly provisioned in busy data center. Well, it's an office commandment, now let me pass the word to my colleague, uh, Maxim Harshenko. Hello everybody, my name is Maxim Harshenko and I'm uh, the founder of Cloud Dozer 2. Um, and uh, I'm the author of most of the early on Zen code. In addition to early on Zen, uh, Cloud Dozer has a couple of other Zen related projects. They are uh, at the early stages of development then, early on then, but we decided to share uh, some preliminary information uh, about this project with the community to solicit early feedback. The projects are DOM0 based uh, on early on Zen and uh, JavaScript in a Zen bottle. The first project is about replacing Linux in DOM0 with Erlen and Zen. The idea is to do, to do so came to our minds then we were implementing a fast spawning interface for Erlen and Zen. All standard interfaces were not fast enough. Uh, we were trying to achieve uh, really fast speeds. We tried to tap the lowest level this, uh, of, uh, of the stack uh, possible, which is LibXL. If you have a look at the LibXL code, you will notice a lot of similarities uh, between it uh, and Erlang. LibXL introduces event, uh, events, uh, spawns, uh, child processes, even use pattern matching. On the other hand, LibXL makes heavy use of OS primitives. It runs bash scripts, allocates pseudo terminals, etc. You definitely cannot build a fast system with this. It would be only too natural to use early and then in DOM0. All interfaces will be much clearer and uh, it may even run forever, requiring no maintenance. DOM0 based on early and then is a step in the direction of autonomous clouds, which were uh, mentioned earlier by Victor. Of course, uh, we immediately stumble upon the necessity to provide hardware drivers and the solution for, th for this is to use the separate unprivileged driver domain. The current status of the project is that we have the fast spawning interface uh, that I mentioned. It is implemented in Erlang and NC and uh, our most prominent demo, Zerg, uses that interface. The second project is JavaScript in a Zen bottle. It's all about executing web scripts in a separate Zen domain. All rendering and interaction with the user and with the network happens in the browser domain, and all scripts are supposed to run in a special script domain. Of course, the performance of JavaScript will suffer in this setup. We estimate that the performance hit for JavaScript uh, will be at around 10-20%. But the neat, neat thing is that we are not uh, limited to JavaScript here. We can use any scripting language or even run native code inside the script domain. We essentially can put a whole operating system in a script domain. JavaScript engines are getting better, but uh, there is still 3-5x uh, performance gap uh, between the native code and, uh, and JavaScript, at, and uh, this gap will not uh, go away. This is especially painful for mobile devices. The Zen bottle for web scripts let us run native code inside the web browser. Uh, the project is similar to Google's native client. But we use Zen uh, for better, more uniform protection. 
The JavaScript is a, um, is a frequent attack vector today, and uh, if a hacker seizes the script domain, it will not help him to get to the rest of the system. The current status of the project is that we have a simple application that uses uh, SpiderMonkey engine encapsulated in a separate Zen domain, uh, and we are working on replacing this application with a whole web browser. This is uh, all about the two uh, Zen-related projects which we have. Uh, your feedback is definitely welcome, and thank you for your attention. And of course, you're very welcome to ask questions. Anybody has questions? Comments? Nobody? Ah, yes. Yeah, I'm not, not hearing the... Uh, yeah, I'm, I have to repeat the question. So the, the question was about the performance of the interaction between a web scrap, script in a different VM to the actual browser. So what yeah. would your, your comment to that be? Yes, this, this is this is very, very natural question uh, here. And I, I expect that the, uh, this kind of uh, packaging of a standard JavaScript will have at least... Uh, uh, 10, probably 15 percent uh, performance penalty. But at the same time, uh, this setup will allow us to run native code instead of JavaScript. So you may have a, a natively implemented Gmail application. There's no JavaScript, no, uh, no JIT, everything statically compiled and then download it as a just a, you know x86 object code and then the, the, this this thing will will run probably three times faster than javascript so that's uh, so you we will have a performance penalty on one side and we will have a benefit from on another does that answer your question Yeah, so I'm saying it's still skeptical, but um, you, you're saying too much for me to repeat it. But um, uh, uh, maybe we'll just have to see and run experiments, and then, of course, you know. <laughs> Yes, it yeah. will become it's, a bit clearer. It's, it's too, too early, too early. Yeah, we 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 hope that it will be, uh, it will be fast enough to make it all worthwhile. I guess one suggestion I would have is um, to get more community feedback and input. In particular, is to start posting some of these ideas, you know, on the users list as well as you know where appropriate on the develop list. And that's yeah. I guess how you you know how you will be able to get more, more input from a wider community. I, I guess that's, that's a good idea. <laughs> do we have uh, any more? There's another question. Do, do you maybe just want to come up okay. rather than me repeating this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's very simple question. Is this open source? Uh, it's very exciting. I'm just wondering if there's any open source patches. Uh, the question is, do you have any open source patches yet? And if not, when do you think they will come? We do not have an, uh, have uh, have a patches to the to the Zen uh, you know core, but we have uh, have some uh, uh, some uh, uh, software which talks directly to to LibXL, and uh, we we sharing it with uh, with uh, our partners who use Zen on Zen, so it's kind of semi open source. But we're just not uh, ready to release it uh, because of the, the you know documentation state is is, is a bit you know sketchy and uh, uh, it just uh, it just needs needs a, a brush up. And also, I would I would also uh, 
uh, rather uh, welcome so that uh, this effort will somehow get synchronized with what was going on in a, you know in, in, a, in a Zen project itself so we are we just we doing we're doing something like uh, replicating stuff essentially uh, uh, making some things obsolete so like uh, so that's why uh, it's not like a patch. It's like a, like a, a completely new thing, and definitely we just need to to work uh, uh, closer to the community just to get uh, to get uh, uh, valuable contribution to to it. Yeah, I mean, maybe we can have a chat about this. Sometimes we have processes and mechanisms for that in the Xen community to do these kind of yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? No, not at this stage. Well, thank you for um, for the talk. Um, I think, uh, despite the uh, um, remoteness, this works very well. And uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much.